Hi, my name is Bridget Richardson, and I'm the Assistant Director of Ecumenical and Pastoral Initiatives at the Nesty Center for Faith and Culture at University of St. Thomas in Houston. And I'm here with Rita Simmons. Uh, she's the Events Coordinator at Crossroads Cultural Center. So thank you so much, Rita, for joining me today. It's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, and Rita, you're in Brooklyn right now, right? Correct. Yeah, so can you explain a little bit about uh, Crossroads Cultural Center, I, we shared beforehand that, you know, I've been, I've known about Crossroads for a while and I really enjoy um, your mission and the work that y'all do. So can you describe what it is? Well, before uh, the pandemic hit us, you know, we were sponsoring different cultural events. Um, we, ha we have about four or five events per uh, season. So we have a spring season and then a, and then a fall season. And we generally have uh, four categories of topics. One is beauty will save the world. And those are like artistic events or uh, musical performances, theater, different things like that. We have uh, human affairs. Um, we have memory and identity events. These are usually panel discussions about, you know, our origins, our history, um, you know, topics, you know, that have to do with different cultures and, and uh, identities of people. Um, and then we have um, meetings at the crossroads and these are like interviews with people like face-to-face -face encounters with interesting people um we also have a lecture series we have two lecture series one in the spring which is the jasani series which is the series uh, we, we have a speaker come and give us a lecture um based on faith and reason and how uh, how faith intersects you know with culture um, and it's based on the teachings of our the founder of communion and liberation monsignor luigi Giussani, who passed away in 2005 and um, so we we carry on his you know his teachings through the charism of communion and liberation he was uh very very much concerned about faith and culture it's a very big preoccupation of his taught us to really think about these things that I'm telling you, like beauty and human affairs, memory and identity, you know, things like that. Um, in the fall, we have our Albacete series. And Monsignor Albacete was the chairman of the Crossroads Advisory Board, and he was one of our main speakers for many years. Um, and, you know, he was also very inter interested in faith and culture. Um, but he was uh, born in Puerto Rico. He lived much of his priesthood in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> he moved to, excuse me, <clears throat> he moved to New York City and he became an advisor to us, became very much involved in our, in our movement. He passed away in uh, 2014, in October of 2014. So he was a big personality. He was a... Um, very funny guy, um, very tuned in to culture, and and he was a priest, so he was a man of great faith, um, very human, and a lot of people really loved him. So you know we kind of carry on his his legacy, honoring him through this other lecture series called the Albacete Lecture. So that's that's in October. Um, we also have had uh, a series, a lecture series based on a topic like um, the religious awareness in modern man with a series of lectures. Um, what's faith got to do with it? You know, so we had a series of those kind of lectures. Um, that was Monsignor Bassetti. He gave us like um, faith in money, you know, faith in love, you know, all of these different topics. Um, we had, uh, a series on music, on classical music. One of our friends, Jonathan Fields, a great uh, lecturer on classical music. He 
he spoke to us and gave us a series of lectures. And these are all free, open to the public. You know, so we've done a lot. We've been around since um, 2004, I think. It started 2004. I jumped on board in 2006. I'm going to have to take a sip of this. Excuse me, my throat's dry. Oh, no, you're fine. <laughs> I love hearing about all the programming that y'all have done. It's just I mean, it's, it's all on our website. You can, you can uh, read transcripts. Then after a certain point, I'm sorry, my throat is just, excuse me. <clears throat> I should mute and clear my throat. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's all on our website. You can, um, you can look at the videos on our website. You can um, read transcripts. Prior to when we started posting videos, we had transcripts. So it's all there. And, you know, whatever you, you're interested in, you know, you could just take a look at it, screen it. You, you could screen, if you find something interesting, you could screen it with a bunch of people. You know, we've had some beautiful events. You know, I really encourage people to take a look at those videos read those okay. transcripts yeah and now that coronavirus has set in is that how y'all are primarily doing your work or how has that changed um not only with crossroads cultural center and you have hubs throughout the united states there's one we were just talking there's one here mm -hmm. in houston for us right um how has that changed your programming and the way that you do the work that you're doing well now we can't organize public events we don't know how long that's going to go on, but we do. We did want to deal with the matter at hand, which was the coronavirus. And since our community started in northern Italy, where the pandemic broke out, you know, it was for a while it was the worst place in the world for the pandemic. You know, we started getting a lot of letters from Italy, and people were translating them into English and we knew that New York was just a step behind. So we thought that this would be helpful and we would send these things out, but we were looking for letters and articles that broadened reason, which didn't just narrow in on a, a political fact or an economic fact or um, a healthcare fact or a statistical fact, but we just wanted something that really, really showed that there was a bigger factor at work inside of all of this. We would, we were looking for the positivity of this uh, terrible scourge. And so that's what we wanted to do is we, we wanted to send around these articles to help people to face this situation in a different way, in a new way in a way that maybe they hadn't thought about before. Yeah, and I reached out to you after getting these articles weekly because I they were so moving. You know, you get an article from a doctor in Italy who is dealing with this on the front, line, front lines for a photographer who's going into a church that's now become like a pseudo funeral home. So how do you see these articles as really doing what you're talking about, like broadening our reason, broadening our understanding of what's happening with coronavirus? Well, in my daily life now, because we're at the center of the, the virus right now and the hospitals are overrun, and every day I hear of another person I know who's sick, another person I know who's died. I mean, it's real. It's not a joke. It's, it's, it's real. Um, so it allows me to face the situation without panic, um, understanding that there is there is a good that's coming out of this. We just have to be, to open our eyes and be willing to look for it. Um, and then to be able to contribute to the positivity of the situation by having this new outlook on it. Because if we panic, um, it doesn't, it doesn't help. It doesn't, bring any, any, anything new to the situation. So we're looking for a newness instead of just like regurgitating over and over again, you know, the, the fears and the concerns and the, you know, we know, okay, you have to, you have to know, you have to wash your hands.
it's, you know, you have to know you have to stay six feet away from people. These things we know we have to know it's being drilled into us. You know, there's no shortage of information out there. There's really no shortage of information out there. Um, but what may be lacking is the possibility to make a judgment based on what we see happening. You know, to, you know, Father Jasani said that he talked about experience and he said experience isn't just trying something, but it's making a judgment on what you try. And if you're not able to make a judgment on what you try, but if your life is just, you know, ex just experiencing things over and over and over again without asking yourself the question, well, what is this saying to me? You know, what is this? what is this doing in me? What is this changing in me? What is this answering in me? Then instead of our experience adding to our life and to our personality, it actually empties out our personality. You know, so we try to, you know, live, live our lives looking at what happens to us and asking, how is this for me? What is this event in my life asking of me personally? What is it changing in me? What is it bringing me to? You know, so I think the witnesses or the stories, the letters, the articles that we send around, you know, there's some change that goes on. We were looking for that change because that change is really Christ present there. You know, that's what that newness is, and that's what that change is. And, that is, and, and if, we, if we're Christians, then we have to believe that he's present there because he said, I'm with you always, even to the end of time. So if he says, I'm with you always, so where is he? You know, what the Pope said, well, he's sleeping in the boat, you know, but he's there. You know, so we were looking for that. And, and Christ's presence brings about a change. It brings about a newness. You know, so... Uh, I mean, we are experiencing that in the, in the care. I mean, in the letters that, that, that I sent around, I mean, just the examples, you know, what the, the doctors and nurses, you know, going, going to the hospitals, you know, looking at their colleagues in a different way, you know, the, the cooperation among them, you know, the, the doctor who, who was an atheist, you know, and then he found his faith because a man came in with a Bible, you know, and he noticed, you know, that through this man's death, there was more peace in, in the emergency room, in the, in the ICU, just because of the presence of this man of faith. Um, so people are looking, they're, they're, they're taking notice, um, they're asking, they're searching, they're helping they're, they're, they're united towards a single purpose, which is, you know, to, to give hope in some way to, to their fellow man, to their fellow human beings. The hum, their humanity is being brought forth in this. In New York City, Maimonides Hospital, that's where my son was born, it's a Jewish hospital. But people of all faiths are coming together and they're actually praying before their shift. I mean, where does that happen? How, what, what could make that happen? You know, a pandemic could make, but, but, you know, I think that it's really true that, you know, the, the deeper the darkness, the greater the light, you know, so you're going to just see some incredible light shining forth through all of this. And, but my, my greatest concern is my own life because, I mean, that's what I'm, I'm very curious about, you know, like what is, what is being asked of me right now? What change? is being asked of me because things like this don't happen unless we're being asked to change. If you, if you reflect on any event in your life that was difficult, you know, you could see that there was change that was being asked of you in that. If you really judge it, you really reflect on it. So what was the change that was being asked of me? Where was this newness inserted? Where did I see this newness inserted into my life? This, I mean, even, you know, even Christ when he was, I mean, I like the, um, the Mel Gibson movie, 
when, when Christ is carrying the cross and he, he falls down and he looks at his mother and he says, see, I have made all things new. Like even in the midst of his deepest suffering, you know, there's, there is something is at work. Something is happening. Something is going on because we tend to look at life and say, you know, what's, you know, what's being done here? You know, like we, we have this like powerless, this feeling that we're just like a cog in the wheel and we just have to go along with what's ever happening. We don't realize that we're part of a newness that is going on, especially as Christians, you know, called, you know, I mean, I, I don't know if you wanted me to get super religious on you. I guess you're, you no, that know. was amazing. <laughs> I'm no, sorry. I, I love how you talk about the newness and, you know, I go back to a part of the mission statement that y'all have is with the beauty, you know, it seems to me that your movement and what you're experiencing is trying to find beauty in that suffering through these stories, through these um, experiences that people are sharing. How do you further in your, I, I guess in your realm and your world, how do you further encourage people to look for that beauty and to discover that newness within themselves that you're also trying to, to find? You have to be true to yourself. Um, and I think I've had a lot of Zoom conversations with, with friends, you know, that's how everybody's connecting nowadays. We can't see each other, but we do, we do meet with each other like you and I are meeting right now. And um, the conversation doesn't start out happy. It takes a while, you know, talking it out. Okay, what are you experiencing? What's going on in your life, you know? Um, people talk and they start to see this glimmer of hope, this, this glimmer of beauty, this, um, like for example, a friend of mine, she said to me, and, and new discoveries too. A friend of mine said it was Easter and her mother is in her, she's 80 now, I think her mother's 80 and She's pretty much alone. And her mother said, I want to come over and spend Easter with you. And of course, that's a big no-no because first of all, if you're 80, you're very, you're very um, susceptible to getting the virus and, and dying. It's a reality. You know? um, and her mother said, what's the point of living if I have to live this way? And so my friend thought about it. She talked it over with her family members and they worked it out. They had Easter dinner outside. They kept, they, the, their mother they had a table like six feet away from them and they spent the time together. I mean, they became, and it was a beautiful Easter, you know, but they found a way to be creative within all of it. Because if you think about it, it's true. Like if you're 80 years old, what's, you know, you don't want to be alone on Easter Sunday. I mean, you fun. So what's the real value here? You know, is there a greater value than life? You know, is there something that, that, that goes beyond that? And I think that this virus is asking us that question. It's posing that question to us. Um, it's making us do things differently. It's, 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 forcing us to be creative in our circumstances. Um, another thing that she said that was very interesting, she said, you know, uh, my life used to be pretty spread out. I'd go here, I'd go there. One day I'd have lunch with this person. Another day I'd have drinks with this person. Another day I'd have coffee with this person, you know. And she said, and now uh, the parameters of my life are so clearly defined the people that I need to take care of and attend to are so, they're absolutely positively chosen for me right now in my life. And so, you know, I, I realize like I don't have anything else to do but to attend to what's given to me. Like I don't have to think about oh, well, what am I going to do now? Or who am I going to spend time with? Or should I go to this party or that one or this lecture or that? You know, it's just her life is, is very much uh, 
in all of our lives. It's, they're, they're right in front of us. They're just given to us. And we, we have to move forward with exactly what we have, exactly what we've been given. So that's, that's also been a, a gift in a way to really just to be able to focus on what it is that is at hand to be simple in that sense i think there's a lot more simplicity living more simple lives people are um, looking for ways to be together even within their own families that they haven't before and then relationships that are no good i mean it's coming to the forefront you know people are discovering like i don't want to be with this person at all i can't people distract you know before you could distract yourself if you were in a bad relationship and now it's like no i you know you're i remember a friend of mine who passed away she died of cancer she was young and she had lived with a guy and she told me before she died, she said, you know, I just, it's sad, you know, that at the end of my life, I just, I didn't choose the right person to be with me. You know, like you just discover these things when a crisis hits, like you realize that, you know, the authenticity of your relationships, I think. You know? So things like that come out in crisis moments also. Um, so there's a lot of so so you could see that newness is at work. It doesn't it's not always it's it's usually painful to have to acknowledge that something is not what you thought it was. You know, but that's that's truth. And that's what moves us forward. So like you said, you know, to be truthful. Be truthful, to be honest with yourself and then to become creative within your circumstances. And that's what, even in the letters that you send out, that's what I see is the the truthfulness. Because even in the letters, I you'll start reading it and a person is having one expectation of the day or what they thought was going to happen. And by the end of the letter, it's totally flipped on its head where they have internalized it or thought about it. And they've really kind of been real with themselves in their own authenticity and said, this is not what I thought it was going to be. Yeah. And if, you know, if people wanted to read those letters and get connected with Crossroads and um, Communion and Liberation, how would they do that? Well, uh, we have a website and I could, I mean, I would just say a lot of the trend, a lot of the translations are done in England. So there's the punctuation is a little different. Some of the spellings are a little different. <laughs> so just be aware of that. I mean, I could, uh, let me see if I can get you to the, I can send you that link. Yeah, and I can definitely include the link in our description of this conversation because I think, you know, if people could even be on the mailing list to get these weekly letters, just seeing the whole world from a different perspective in this way where people are encountering the suffering and they're making these judgments about what their role is in it and what it's supposed to mean for them moving forward and creating that newness and finding hope in that has been, it's been really, truly eye-opening. You can look, there's news, there's stories, there's letters, there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of um, different things going up there. I'll just, I just give you stories, but we had a um, friend who actually was a Crossroads speaker. I, I'm a poet, so he actually, and we had an event where he accompanied uh, a friend of mine and I uh, were reading our poetry, and he and another friend, they played guitar and piano. They created original pieces to the poetry that we read. It was called um, Poetic Images in New York City from Skin Decor, I think it was called. The Big Apple, you know, New York City from skin to core, something like that. And so David Horowitz, he's Jewish, and he met our community um, some years ago, like in the 90s, and he always remained friends. And he was he was deeply moved and deeply struck by by the authenticity of the friendship. 
that he encountered by the way that he could just be who he was. He didn't have to become Catholic, you know, to be a part of what was going on. Um, and he was actually able to appreciate his own faith so much more because of his relationship with the friends in the community. And so he recently passed away. He died of COVID-19, he was 77. And a beautiful, there's a beautiful article written about him that you might like to read, especially since you're, you're all about ecumenism. You know, there's a couple articles that they've written about him actually. Um, Yeah, it'll be great to read about him and just I'll share all these articles in our description as well. And Rita, I just want to thank you so much, as I mentioned to you before, for being open to this conversation. You're the way that you can enlighten me <laughs> on some of these things. And I hope other people in terms of looking to that newness and looking within to be truthful with ourselves in the moment. Um, it's so important during time of crisis to have that time. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. And I'm, I, I'm sorry that I didn't do better than what I did. Uh, I, I tried, but, you know, I was kind of, a, it's been, you know, it's been a while since we've, we've had events, you know, so it's hard for me to put my head in that space right now. So I apologize for that. No, this is great. So thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Bridget. Keep in touch. Definitely. Okay.